Hello, everyone. Let me go ahead and let everybody sort of filter in here just a little bit. Whenever you click these things off, you just start seeing the attendee populace just grow and grow and grow. So I'll give us about one minute and then we'll go ahead and get started. For those of you that don't know, my name is Tyler. I'm uh, the CMO here at Azoic, and I'm going to be kicking off today's uh, global event because we are a global company. And I know some of you are probably staying up late. Some of you, it's probably pretty early in the mornings where you're at. Uh, here it's 10 a.m. in beautiful and what is sunny today, California. Um, read the other day that we actually got more rain in the last month and a half than Seattle. So for those unfamiliar with the United States, Seattle is notorious for rain. Southern California notorious for droughts, uh, especially these days. And so, um, yeah, it's nice to have a nice sunny uh, Monday morning to kick off customer week here at Zoic. And I will kick us off with what I think will be some both exciting news and then I think a really interesting perspective on where um, a lot of the development and a lot of where we've positioned um, a lot of the announcements that you'll hear about this week um, around historically and also sort of looking forward into the future. And I'll give us about 30 more seconds and we'll go ahead and kick off with what I have planned for everyone today. I want to reiterate that we've got um, quite a bit of stuff that we'll cover both today and throughout the week. And so um, you'll probably hear me say this and you'll see a lot of material on it, but ezoic.com slash customer dash week uh, dash 2022, I believe. Uh, I will have the link up on the screen here uh, towards the end, but you can get all the recordings, any news or information that we release this week will be available on that on that page. And we'll also at the end, we'll have a place where you can actually go and submit questions about anything that you have this week that myself and then different members of our expert team will answer and publish so that everybody can can see answers to common questions that people might have this week regarding any of the announcements or any of the new exciting things that we have planned. So with that being said, um, let's go ahead and get started. So I want to welcome everyone to Customer Week. And in doing so, um, if you just joined, uh, I am Tyler, our CMO. And there's a lot that we have this week planned for everyone that I'm excited to, to share. And um, I'm going to kind of start off with a little bit of a presentation that I think positions historically where we're coming from and where we think we're positioning our publishers for the web. And that's why. Really, we're going to start by looking into the future by kind of looking a little bit at the past. And one of the things that I want to highlight is the difference between what people think of as trends and then also what the data supports as a trend. So uh, this is from almost 10 years ago, a little over 10 years ago. It's from 2012. Um, and at the start of 2012, Ars Technica had published an article of why they felt like uh, mobile had reached its apex. The iPhone was released in 2009 and mobile was growing. Uh, it was only about 13% of internet traffic and the, the sort of thinking back then was that, well, eventually mobile will take over the majority of internet traffic, but like in a hundred years, you know, it was kind of thought as this sort of like, well, mobile is here, but not necessarily something you have to pay close attention to. However, if you looked at the data, the data would show you that that was the beginning of an exponential curve. And the exponential curve at the start of mobile would show you that essentially um, mobile not only was here to stay, but mobile was going to be taking over a lot sooner than what maybe many would have predicted. Now, in the same token, you would have found that there was a number of stories and there was a big amount of, uh, I guess, media coverage and hype around sort of voice search, which there is still today. Uh, I'm not anti-voice search. I know that Siri drives me crazy sometimes whenever I'm like, hey, Siri, turn on the lights. And it's like, I'm sorry, I can't call your father. It's a little bit frustrating, but nevertheless, voice search continues to penetrate and grow. But if you looked at that curve at the time when everybody was saying, hey, voice search, personalized search, this is going to be the future, you'd notice that the data would show that that curve was leveling off. And the reason for that leveling off is because 
you could look at the data and understand that it was not sort of getting adopted in the same way that mobile was getting adopted. And those things were sort of intertwined. And so it was, if you were looking at data as opposed to trying to understand maybe a narrative around what the trend was, you'd be able to understand that these things were like predictable, maybe in a way that people wouldn't have thought. Yeah, so you can kind of see right there sort of the leveling off of that curve, and which is quite a bit different than the mobile sort of curve, which was sort of going in the other way. You can kind of see at the top line of that curve kind of penetrating through the top. And so it was fairly predictable that mobile would be the new king here. And so you kind of see through 2012 through now, mobile became the dominant form of traffic much sooner than what many would have possibly thought. You can sort of see that curve now, that leveling off, where you maybe have a lot of pundits now talking about how mobile may be the future. It's going to be 100% of internet traffic here in the next five years. Well, that is probably not going to be the case. Mobile will stay the majority of internet traffic, but it's likely not going to become this 100% of mobile or internet traffic here anytime soon. Now, the other thing that I want to highlight, and this is something that I, I, I find kind of interesting because uh, for publishers that have been around for uh, 10, 20 years, you'll remember this. Uh, 10 years ago, Google was not considered the most reliable form of traffic. I know, it seems crazy. Um, not in that they were not reliable or they weren't considered, you know, maybe even still the, the top reliable source of traffic, but building a Facebook page 10 years ago was a really nice hacky, not hacky, but it was a nice hack to be able to get an audience and traffic fast. You could build a Facebook page for next to nothing and you could have a page with, I don't know, two, three million followers. And then everything you published to your Facebook page, you could then drive traffic to your website. It was this great system that publishers, many of which built their business upon. Around that time, 2012, 2013, some of you that have been around for a minute may remember the Panda updates, the Hummingbird updates. They had lots of fun animals that that shuttered a lot of publisher businesses because they were changing aggressively their ranking system. And because of that, a lot of publishers started to migrate towards Facebook. And this is where I want to highlight to publishers that while it may seem like some things in publishing are here to stay and that they are likely to not change, if there's one thing that we know about publishing, it's that change is a fixed element. This is going to happen whether you like it or not change is going to happen and the platforms that many of us are building our businesses upon those things are going to change as well and as a publisher you've got to mitigate the risk of giving them so much of your business and i'm going to talk a little bit more about that and some of the innovations we have planned uh later today and later this week we'll we'll have a special kind of elongated version of um, sort of this presentation for our Club 22 members. But until then, I do want to highlight at least one example of uh, winners and losers over the past uh, 10 years. And there's no greater winner, in my opinion, than a, a little website many of you may have heard of, uh, a website by the name of Wikipedia. And so Wikipedia is a pretty popular little website, uh, user-generated content largely. Um, fact checked by a staff and a staff that's largely not changed over the last decade. And I'm going to compare them to a really, really similar site that was, I don't know that it's fair to say around the same size, but was pretty competitive with them about 10 years ago. And that is answers.com. <coughs> Excuse me. Answers.com actually was around the same size and they were a direct competitor. Um, the paths for both of those businesses has looked quite a bit different. So you can see kind of a zoomed in look here. Uh, what I find really fascinating about this is, um, I actually didn't know this until we looked it up, uh, but so on the left hand side, you can see both Wikipedia from 2012 and Wikipedia from 2022. So like just the other day, um, it's amazing how identical they look. I don't think that an ounce of the CSS on the page has changed. There's almost nothing about the user interface has changed. Um, Answers.com, however, not only did they change their URL and permalink structure, they changed their business strategy. They tried to be a social media 
company for a hot, for a hot second, and you can kind of see the differences between their site today and then. They they essentially pivoted completely away from being an answers based website all the way back to trying to do that again now, being more of like a Quora or um, yeah, something or almost even like Reddit or like a disc open Discord. Um, but this lack of sort of like focus and this lack of vision, um, you can kind of see the results uh, in their search traffic over time. You can see that Wikipedia, and uh, I want to, I do want to point out that on the Wikipedia side, that those are Bs, and on the right hand side with answers, those are Ms. So billions compared to millions. So you can see starting out, Wikipedia had a little bit of an advantage um, with several billion, but the growth has been exponential. Answers.com on the trend that they're they're at right now, um, there's, you know, they're headed towards zero if you can't tell. Um, and it's it's this sort of lack of being able to understand the audience, creating value versus chasing a profit. Answers.com received VC money. They they had all these ideas about where they thought the trends were going to go. Wikipedia understood their audience, knew exactly what that audience wanted, and they built their strategy around it. It's one of the reasons why the interface literally hasn't changed because the users didn't need that. They knew that changing the interface, that was their ego driving it, not necessarily the data. And that's where I'm going to start to get into things today, is I want to talk about how Ezoic is preparing our publishers for the future. Because if, if there's one thing that we love, it's data. It's being able to take the information and all the insights that we're able to gather from the tens of thousands of websites using Ezoic, the billions of page views that we get to see every few months that roll through our platform that highlight different changes and trends in our space in preparing our publishers for the future. So I want to take a step back. And so for many of you, you may want to roll your eyes at this moment, but I do want to highlight something that I think sticks out to me. And for our publishers that have been around for seven, eight years using our technology, um, this will be a, be a bit of a refresher, but what we've always done as a business is built technology around publishing to help support publishers as the barrier to entry and the barrier to succeed has grown, has both grown in terms of um, requirement and then also grown, grown in terms of complexity. So um, maybe seven, eight years ago, there was the mobile friendly or uh, later on, mobile mobile first, but first it was mobile friendly. You had to have a mobile friendly website. And for a lot of publishers, mobile wasn't the majority of the traffic. They didn't care too much about mobile. And so we had Layout Tester. In Layout Tester, we built specifically so that publishers could instantly make their sites mobile friendly. This was a big boom in our customer base at the time because we had a number of sites that essentially were like, we don't have a mobile website. We don't know how to make one. So Ezoic, boom, instant mobile website. Next, we had the um, we had this big update that Google had that was essentially the number of ads per page in AdSense. That rule changed. Um, they switched from what was called a uh, first look or first well first look and first price are two different things. But essentially, everybody in the space bid differently than Google got to bid on their ad exchange. This was. Uh, considered unfair in a lot of ways. And so this made the importance of being able to create a fair playing field through things like mediation, which we built, um, and header bidding, which was something that no one in the space knew whether or not it was gonna go away or not. Everybody knew that everything was about to change in the way that ad bidding took place. And because we have a huge data science department and a massive engineering team, we were able to build around that. And that was something that a lot of publishers had to struggle with. They had ad ops teams that they either had to lay off or um, you know, take a big risk on. And this is something that we were very well prepared for and prepared our publishers for. Then you had something like GDPR, where seemingly overnight, uh, the state of California and the, you uh, followed suit shortly thereafter of providing all these privacy laws for publishers that were meant to penalize big tech, but for some reason, uh, all the onus to, to comply fell on the publisher. And so now all of a sudden you have all these consent um, parameters that you have to fulfill. And if you don't, maybe 
you know, the EU or the state of California or one of these other sort of um, municipalities would come along and they would shutter your business with a massive, uh, massive fine. And while this has not necessarily been something where we've seen a lot of businesses shot in the street, it is an inherent risk if you decide that you're not going to comply. And so what did we do? We built a technology that takes all the hard parts of this for publishers and makes it very easy to manage. And it does it without having to go buy uh, I forget what the name of the really expensive one that all the big e-commerce businesses use, but it's one trust, I think. Um, without having to manage this big enterprise level software, we provided that to all of our publishers. Um, and then site speed. I don't know. I, does anybody here want to have a fast website? Why would you want such a thing? Well, no one wanted that five or six years ago. And then now, uh, it's become something that's probably overly emphasized in terms of its importance. Um, and in our first attempt, uh, we we tried to make something that we thought was going to be excellent and solve this problem for our publishers. We went back to the drawing board after a year. Uh, we we realized that what our publishers needed was something that was easier. And we also saw a lot of the problems that site speed brings to publishers. Every Every piece of technology inside of WordPress works differently. They all conflict with each other. None of them work together. Every tool, theme, plugin has different settings that do the exact same thing and just create more problems and actually slow the site down. So we wanted to build a tool that all in one took the place of all those things and made it easy to optimize. And we want to give it to our publishers for free. So we did that with Leap. And so that begs the question, what do we do now? And this is really, to be honest, something that we've been working on for, um, yeah, the better part of the last three or four years. And so this year, we're, we're really going to be uh, announcing a lot of what we've worked on for the past few years. And if there's four events that sort of define these, these sort of announcements, and many of you have been kind of following along the last month of some of the different product releases that we've had, but I want to highlight four specific events that I think are quite significant for publishers. And if you're not paying attention to these, please do. Number one, Google in September, and they've done different iterations of this, released their uh, product review algorithm update. This was designed so that if you were writing reviews on the best vacuum cleaners, let's say, uh, and you'd never used any of those vacuum cleaners and didn't know anything about vacuum cleaners, that Google itself was going to try to understand your content and it didn't want you to be just creating content for the sake of making profit. It wanted to be able to give a user genuine information when it came to reviews or recommendations around the best vacuum cleaner. Now, as a user and as somebody that has actually looked for this, I have two dogs at home and I needed a vacuum cleaner that was gonna pick up all the dog fur that's everywhere. Um, I don't want to find a website that's going to recommend to me a bunch of vacuum cleaners that are just maybe the most profitable for them to sell through an affiliate link. And so this update is built for the user. It's built for the audience. And websites that now rank there um, are designed to be the ones that are going after what the audience is actually looking for. And this is a good thing. It's quality. Quality content matters, and it matters a lot. And in doing that, Google has also made a lot of comments recently about AI writing content. Uh, I'll spare you some of the examples I've given in the past, but a great example of why AI can't write great content, or at least is not going to be able to in the next few years, um, and maybe even longer, is because it takes humans to be able to determine the quality of written content. So why written content and not video content, Tyler? Because if you are getting ahead of me, you might realize that Flickify, a article to video creator AI tool that we've launched, um, Tyler, video, AI can't write content, but it can make video content. That's right, because AI can turn written content, good written content, into high quality video content that complements it. However, if I want to know, for example, um, how, to, how to soothe a crying baby, this is the example I always give. Um, the quality and context of that content matter a lot. So you can get the medical book information about this, but for any parents out there, and I'm not a parent, um, uh, not outside of having some dogs, um, as you now know, uh, 
not being a parent, I want to know exactly how would I stop a crying baby if I'm watching my niece and I'm holding her and she's crying. Um, you know, the medical book is not going to give me the information that I want. I want some tips. I want some practical advice. Now, if I was to go and write an article about how to do that, I'm not quite an expert. However, my mother, who, from what I understand, I was what they call a fussy baby. I cried quite a bit. Um, she could probably write that article quite a bit better than me. So you can see that the human element of this is what defines the quality, the, the quality of it. Now, being able to take that quality and turn it into video is a much, much shorter leap than being able to have a robot match exactly the knowledge of someone like my mother. Now, if we go move ahead as to why exactly those two pieces of news in particular are important, um, and I'll get to the other two here in just a minute. Those two particular pieces of news are important because one of the tools that we've launched is specifically designed to um, help you create, find, and adapt your content to what an audience wants. So why, why have we never released a keyword research tool? And why even now uh, will I not call niche IQ or niche IQ, if you will? I pronounce niche, niche. And internally here, uh, I'm in the minority, and it's a point that's hotly contested. I'm from the Midwest in the United States, and so I can't help myself. I'm going to call it niche IQ. So you guys are just going to have to come with me on that journey. But niche IQ, as everyone else in the office calls it, um, was designed to provide topic suggestions. Why? And why are we in position to do this better than anyone? Because all keyword tools are actually built for advertisers and marketers. What do I mean by this? If you take a tool like SEM Rush, for example, you'll find that the only costs or dollar amounts that are associated with the keyword are for advertisers, CPCs. These things are not always correlated to what a publisher is able to earn. So being able to tie the amount of money that you might make from an article to the query, the difficulty of it, and also how well positioned your site is to potentially rank for that is very important. No one is looking at this as if they're a niche site or a publisher. That's exactly what we did. And not only that, we've built in tools for testing. I love the artistic side of publishing. Myself, I consider myself an artist. I cut my teeth being a content marketer. Um, but at the end of the day, data is what drives real results. And if you're going to try different title tags or you want to maybe understand how different link structures work in your website, these are things you need to test and understand. And knowing how many backlinks you have or um, you know, hearing from a friend that if you put a number at the start of your article that it's going to rank higher, you know, that's great. But ultimately, like you should go and find those things out for yourself. And that's exactly why we, we created the standalone tool. So this is one site. It's been using the tool for three months. Visits, 39% increased, over a million impressions increased. And it ranks for over 2,000 new queries and has a, a massive increase in CTR. So you might say, Tyler, there's a billion sites on Ezoic that are doing this already. You, they didn't need the tool. Correct. They didn't. But how much time did they spend doing keyword research? How much time did they spend trying to outline articles for writers? How many people on the payroll spent time on this? This is something I want publishers to better understand, which is every ounce of time that goes into your site that isn't creating content, that isn't specifically doing what your audience wants. This is your product. Your content is your product. Anytime you're not focusing on improving that or getting more product out to your customers, you're losing money. And this product makes it easier to do that. Now, another product that I think makes it quite a bit easier, I've referenced earlier, and that is Flickify. Flick Flickify careful how fast you say the name <laughs> it, that was a big thing here internally as well it's like flickify how fast can you say it three times i'm not going to even try but you can try how many let me know how many of you actually just are trying that right now um flickify for example turns articles into videos you can actually take your existing articles and it will automatically or audio magically no nah, that's not right 
<laughs> it will turn them into actual videos. And you can actually customize, you can add themes, you can add your logo, you can change and swap out from a massive stock library that we're adding to every day, millions and millions and millions of free stock videos that you can use inside of this tool to help make sure that you have good quality video on your site for all your articles. I'm gonna show you some Google stats here in a minute. You come from Google, not from me about how much engagement gets added to an article when it has video. Not only that, I'm gonna get into a little bit more of why video is such an important strategy for publishers, but look at the stats. If we pull this up a little bit like closer so that everybody can see, you'll notice that these are from Google's uh, Search Central. This is Google's actual um, like blog for publishers and websites. Video search results have a higher click-through rate. so. Flickify combined with Ezoic and Humix will allow these videos to get indexed in search results independent from your articles. So you double the chance of ranking. I don't know, seems like a good idea. So video search results have a higher click-through rate. You can have these videos indexed in search. Video is 50 times more likely to get an organic ranking than plain text results. Ah, 50 times more likely to get traffic. Sounds good to me. And if your site has video, people stay longer. People being on your site longer is a good thing in just about every case, whenever it's organic. And you can see this is one of my favorites because this site has barely used Humix for, I think, a handful of months. They were one of our early beta testers, haven't even used the full product until recently, created over 35 new videos, total revenue year to date from those 35 videos created just with Flickify. $13,154, over 10 million views. It's, it's game changing. And you're gonna see from some of the stats here on Humix that this isn't something that only offers mega upside value to large sites or even small ones. This is something that provides exponential growth prospects to just about any website that wants to focus on this as a strategy. So this is a fun fact. If you follow me on Twitter, you already know the answer to this question, but uh, this is a fun one for trivia. And now you'll all know it, same as me. Um, and that is that the world's largest search engine is Google. Any guesses as to the world's second largest search engine? My crew here, anybody? Whitney, I know you don't know the answer to this one yet, so shout it out. <laughs> Bing, <laughs> oh, adorable, Bing. They're not, I, don't, I actually don't think Bing is in the top five. Um, number three is YouTube. Many people always say YouTube second, but it's a trick question. Is uh, Manny, who is operating the camera over here knows, uh, it's actually Google Images and Video that's number two. So yeah, Whitney, not, not really all that fair. Um, um, bang. Um, but Google Images and Video is actually a separate index. So as I mentioned before, the increased likelihood of ranking whenever you get a video indexed in uh, Google search, um, it's actually a separate index. You can think of it as a separate search engine altogether. So I don't know about you, but being able to be indexed in the first and second largest search engines in the world off of one article that you create seems like a pretty big advantage. So Flickify is quite the tool in this regard. And I can tell you right now, it's the time to use it because a lot of publishers as we speak are getting into it and starting to create a lot of videos. So the opportunity is big, but it's even bigger because I wanna highlight something that really speaks to probably the largest announcement that we've made in terms of product releases. And I don't think that people really understand the significance of it yet. Google is good in a lot of ways, at least in terms of search engines for publishers. YouTube, it's evil, at least for publishers as it relates to search engines. I'm not gonna make a stand either way, one way or the other, they're our partner. I like those guys, but Google as a search engine works in a way that benefits publishers. You have a website, you fulfill some basic open criteria on what it would require to be indexed and Google will rank your content for anybody searching the internet through their search engine. It makes it open, it's fair. Anybody can put their content out there and get traffic. Now, if we pull that graphic up again and we look really close to the YouTube part, YouTube operates nothing like this. YouTube requires that the audience and the content creators both come to them 
and they are going to decide what the audience sees. And they require the content creator put their content into their search engine and their format. It's like AMP, but way, way, way worse. <laughs> and I mean that because the truth is, is that you have zero decision making around how you monetize your content. Like you can, you can hack it. You could sell like some type of uh, brand awareness, like advertisement that you put at the start of your video and you do like a talking, oh, hey, everybody try out the new ramen noodles. I don't know. It's a bad example. It's the first one I came up with. But irregardless, the thing is, is that YouTube is going to determine what you can do with your content. Unless you're uh, a large publisher that they're experimenting with, you're not going to be able to sell subscriptions or donations or anything like that. And unless you reach a certain size, you're not even going to show ads, ads that are strictly designed so that Google is the only person selling ads in that environment. No competition is bad for publishers. We know this. So what did we do about it? That's why we created Humix. Humix is, understandably, it's a couple weeks old, a little bit smaller than YouTube, but billions of potential page views await inside of Humix. And that's really what I want to identify here is that Humix is not small. It's actually so large in comparison to anything else that you could put your content into to distribute it. And here's the thing. It's designed for publishers. It's the best of all search engines for publishers because not only do content creators get to share their video content with their audiences and each other, so we're sharing audiences, but we're also sharing the revenue 50-50 from any ad revenue that's highly contested by advertisers because everybody is forced to compete. They can access the content and the, um, and, and the audience through both humix.com and through publisher websites. It's this massive shared network that's built just for publishers. Now, here's the other really awesome thing about Humix as it relates to publishers being able to share this material with each other is that it's growing significantly. And I want to highlight some, some very specific cases around this. So I want to blow this up. Thanks, Manny, because this is super important. So this is from today. For every video uploaded, up uploaded to Humix right now, 10,000 new views per month. Views. You upload a video to YouTube today, you get 10,000 views in a month, especially if you just create your channel, I'm impressed. I've yet to seen it happen. Create a channel today, upload a video, do nothing, you get 10,000 views, Are you kidding me? There's no way that happens. With Humix, it's the average. Revenue per video per month. For some of our larger publishers, this won't be impressive. For some of the smaller ones, it may be enticing, but nevertheless, $63 on average per video per month based on uploads today. For level twos, level threes, exponentially more, almost basically double each time. Um, level three is not quite, but you know, we're taking into account a lot of different things, Manny. You know, it's math. You guys get it. Top 10 sites currently, um, this is their average Humix revenue per month, $5,670 and growing. So from again, for the larger guys, this is gonna be not so impressive for the smaller ones. It's going to be exponential. Now, here's why it's super impressive to me is because those top 10 sites, um, they're not just the big ones. We have level one and access now sites. Three of those top 10 sites are now earning 90 plus percent of all the revenue just from Humix. So they took basically a website that was making, I don't know, maybe a hundred dollars, a couple hundred dollars a month. And they started using and uploading Humix video to it. Bam, $5,670 on average. That's three sites inside of Access Now and Level 1. That's the potential with something like Humix. Same thing for Level 2, Level 3, Leve 4, and VIP. It's a small typo there. I put these slides together, so that's on me, guys. Sorry about that. And that's is leading us to our, our final sort of, uh, and this is pretty much the, the big announcement for this week that a lot of you will start seeing is that We've decided that it's so important that these, these different tools and features get their own interfaces because there's so much value. I mean, I, I think you've seen with something like Humix, I'd be surprised if everybody not attending this webinar immediately goes, gets into Flickify, gets into Humix and starts messing with video to, to really drive increased performance. 
um, we realize that these things don't need to be built into our ads product. And that's why Ezoic Ads is getting its own redesigned full interface. And this makes it so that, A, it's going to be easier to optimize, easier to manage, and easier to set up, and also ensure that you're like taking full advantage of everything that we've built into our products while also still being able to use something like Humix or Flickify without feeling like, oh, did I mess something up with my ad stuff or something along those lines? And the reason is, is because you want to be able to diversify where and how you make money on your website, whether it's through video or through um, advertising or through a whole host of other monetization options that are available to publishers. I think that diversity is good. It's, it's good. You don't want to get all your traffic from Google. You don't want to get all your traffic from YouTube. You don't want to get all your traffic through a platform in general. You should have a subscriber list, a newsletter list. These are things that allow you to connect further with your uh, audience and create better content. You look at something like Amazon that slashed their affiliate rates for, uh, I believe, uh, Amazon Associates. They've done it a couple of times in the last few years. Twitch recently cut their revenue share. So did YouTube. These platforms, there's no reason why they have to share any of the revenue eventually. I mean, look at look at what Facebook did. They shuttered businesses based on the fact that they really dialed down reach about seven, eight years ago. And now Amazon, I think overall, less than 1%, maybe less than half a percent of any of their revenue business-wide comes from the associates program. They could shutter it tomorrow. If you think that Amazon associates revenue is something that is like fixed, they'd never get rid of it. There's no reason why if it became even potentially a small headache or maybe they thought they were going to get regulatory concern or they were going to get uh, sued because they had, uh, which they have been for comment um, fraudulence and all this kind of stuff. They might just get rid of the program. Now, you might think I'm crazy. I mean, I have no dog in the race. It doesn't matter to me whether or not people use Amazon Associates or some other affiliate program or whatever. But the, the fact of the matter is, is depending on platforms puts you at risk. And that's why it's so important to be able to have tools to be able to manage multiple sources of income and be able to start building audiences in different places without having to hire experts or depend on somebody else to tell you what to do. And that's why we've built these specific products and why we started building them years ago is to put you in position for it's never been more relevant to be able to do these things, to create, to create the right content, to create quality content for your audience, to adapt that content to meet a changing audience. Ten years ago, you wouldn't have imagined that all the publishers or all the audience members that are watching video on your website are probably going to be watching it on a mobile phone. That's the majority of them. Distribute that content without having to upload it and pray that the algorithm gods send you traffic. Humix does that. It allows us to leverage each other. The most dependable thing that we have is one publisher decides that they don't want to share your content anymore. That's fine. That's less than like a fraction of a percent of where you might be getting your audience. Together, we mitigate each other's risk and monetize. Ezoic ads, we've proven that we're the top performer now. We've shown to the industry that you don't have to depend on somebody else that Ezoic provides best in class performance and keeps your long term health like as core importance to why you even monetize your site to begin with is because this is your business. Even though interest might be aligned with somebody else doing it for you, you want to make sure that your interests are aligned to your best interests, which means that your site should be growing in value over time. And that's exactly how we built Ezoic. And I think if we look at the last year, I think it's pretty self-explanatory that the fact that everyone has decided they want to start to move to Ezoic and begin using our tools so they can manage these things themselves speaks for itself. And then tools like Leap highlight why we think it's so important to be able to optimize around current trends. Site speed wasn't a thing six, seven years ago. Now we have a free tool for it. GDPR, now we have a free tool for it. We continue to support our publishers with the technology they need to adapt to modern changes and regulatory requirements. These things aren't necessarily always fun, but it's where we always have our publishers' backs. And that's what I'm really excited about this week is to be showing you exactly how we're changing our product to better basically take these tools and features that we've built and give them their full interface so that you can get the most out of them so that you don't have to rely on somebody to necessarily do it all for you and that you can do these things easier than they've ever been done before.
So what's next? What can you expect through the rest of customer week? Well, let's start with this. If there's anything you feel like you've missed. Oh yeah, this we can, I, I had this slide misplaced. This is my bad, Manny. <laughs> Keep going. So easyoak.com slash customer dash week. Ah, oh, I gave you 2022, 20, I think at the beginning, it's shorter than that. Our webmaster Will's a genius. Ezoic.com slash customer dash week. You can stay up to date on any of the recordings or blogs or announcements or how to's or tutorials that we've created. We know that using some of these things, they may not be intuitive. And so we want to be able to help you understand how to use them the best, how other publishers are using them. And you can get all of this content at Ezoic.com customer dash week. Now, if you have questions for me, you watch this entire thing and you disagree or you say, hey, I have one really important question. That really important question is probably really important to a lot of publishers. And so what we've done this time is we've created a, a place where you can actually go and everyone can submit their questions and myself and our team will pour over them and we'll answer those questions and we will publish them to everyone. So you can get your question answered in long form and be able to understand exactly what it is other publishers are wondering about and get answers to those questions as well. It also makes the process really transparency. Transparency is good for publishing in almost every instance. For the Club 22 members, I just want to say we're looking forward to having you later this week. And uh, there's a version of this presentation that is um, much longer and I think provides some really great insights that will be uh, quite, uh, quite enlightening uh, later this week. So I'm, I'm really looking forward to being able to um, uh, have you kind of join us for that. And last but not least, at the end of customer week, we'll be highlighting a very special announcement. On November 1st, there's something very big coming. Uh, I venture to say it's the most requested and most desired announcement in the Zoic history, believe it or not. So stay tuned. Until then, I'm Tyler Bishop. I wanna thank all of my crew here uh, that helped put this together today. And I wanna thank all of you for being an Zoic customer. And if you join today and you're currently not actively using Zoic, um, you know, race you to the sign up page or race you to the login so that you can start accessing things like Humix and Flickify and our new ads interface. Uh, I want to thank you once again for joining us and for following along with the Zoic Customer Week. Thank you for being an Zoic customer, and I look forward to seeing all of you or talking with some of you uh, again here soon. Thank you very much.